CIM MES discussion group, Perspectives and Insight on Metals and Mines, our continuing series, monthly, bi-monthly throughout the year with uh, topics of interest to our members as well as to our guests. Today, our speaker is Brock Silver. I will go through his CV, but uh, the topic is, is a great headline in Hunter, the life cycle of mineral companies. The life cycle means obviously the duration of some sort, we will find it out. Doug Silver has been researching this topic and I kind of uh, coerced them to, to make this preliminary or advanced preliminary presentation because it's still in process of adding more ideas and more values and more controversy and more recommendations as the research continues. And you will hear more from him in 2025, giving some forms that, of his choice. But today we're privileged to have the insights uh, into what he's doing and why junior company issue is quite controversial. We all know that junior companies have a, an issue of life cycle, duration. Uh, you look at the Northern Miner old books are about different companies. It's actually sometimes thicker, depending what year it is, than the Canadian Miners and Book, which is now electronic. So, the insights will be welcome again to hear from Doug. Can I see the next the slide, uh, Jackie, for CIM? Just to introduce CIM. We are a leading nonprofit technical association to professionals in the Canadian minerals, metals, materials, and energy industries with 11 technical societies and more than 30 local branches across Canada and overseas. CIM vision is with the trusted authority and collective source for advancing mineral industry knowledge, guidelines, and best practices. Our mission, you can highlight, cultivate knowledge, best practices in innovation to support our members, improve awareness of the minerals industry and society, and evolve industry responsibly. It was incorporated in 1898 by an act of parliament of Canada as the Canadian Mining Institute. In, 20, in 1920, it became the Canadian Institute of Mining and Metallurgy. In 1990, Canadian Institute of Mining, Metallurgy and Petroleum. Next slide for introduction. CIMMES, which is our committee, we actively work towards furthering education in mineral economics. And Jackie, you see her name and hear her, her video most probably, She's chairing one, once again, the, the committee is here. We use the funds if we raise to support various educational initiatives and programs in mineral economics at Canadian universities. In addition to members involved in the economics and management of mining, CIMMES has expanded to encompass members involved in all aspects of the management of companies active in mining and petroleum sectors. CIMMES sponsors various events through the, through the year across Canada, such as this internationally in Hong Kong that provide industry professionals with the opportunity to network and share experiences. Insights and ideas on topics relating to the economics, management, and financial aspects of the business is our focus. Next slide. Our general sponsor is Silver Sponsors IM Gold. They've been sponsoring the sessions for a while. We appreciate their contribution and their focus and working with us. Next slide. It is the members' faces at this time to be here uh, for this particular webinar. Doug has the distinguished title of uh, having all the Hall of Fame winnings in the mining business, I think. He has gotten in the United States and he has gotten in Canada and uh, all pretty well in the last few years. I've known Doug personally for the last, I think, 30 plus years through his involvement in the industry and my involvement in the industry, I guess. But uh, his brief CV that we have shows that how much attention he pays and is a student of the industry, dedicated, loyal to make the industry better. And today's presentation will reflect that. Once again, Doug Silver will again 
when he when he embellishes the details and the research is complete. Um, I'm not sure there will be some add-ons next year. We will hear about it. But we all know junior companies are very, very eager to have some guidance and at least some roadmap how to be achievers rather than uh, becoming an statistics. Doug, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, good. All right, well, thank you for inviting me to speak. Uh, what triggered this whole discussion is when I go to various mining conferences, there's multiple sessions on mineral deposits. There's multiple sessions on operations. There's sections on price forecasting. And nowadays, we always at least have one to one or more sessions on ESG. But nobody ever talks about the companies. And uh, I started doing this research a couple of years ago, and it's not done yet. Um, but what I want to do is I want to change it. I want us to talk about the demographics of mineral companies because there's a lot of lessons you can learn about how the industry performs and maybe how you can perform better. So this is first of, of more than one speech. And this one's going to be a primer where I'm just going to talk about the life cycles of mineral companies. And um, it's part of a much bigger study which I'm trying to address, are there too many mineral companies? And for those of you trying to raise money, you know, it's been like a tough couple of years. And uh, so a lot of people are saying, well, there's too many companies. I'm trying to do the science behind it to prove it right or wrong. So let's run through some, some basics here. And uh, this is available to anybody who wants a copy. And we will uh, post it, by the way, on the on the website later on. Yeah. We'll talk about it. Yeah. Okay, Scott. so... First slide, if we look at if we look at North American public mineral companies, 86% of them are Canadian, with the majority of them listed on the TSXV and um, followed by the CSE, which has come on like gangbusters, and then, of course, the TSX. This is based on a study I did in 2022 where I looked at 150 stock exchanges. Uh, now, here's the important one. If you look at just the North American stock exchanges, you can see that the majority of the companies are on the TSXV, and most of these are expiration companies, followed by developers. The difference between the two is anybody who, who has an expiration project, a discovery, or a maiden resource, I would consider an explorer, where developers would be starting to do engineering. And then, of course, we all know what producers are. Curiously, the CSE has come in second place in terms of the total number of companies. And as you can see, most of them are at the expiration level, with very few being developers or producers. The, the reason I bring this up is, is how I collected my data. I wanted to show you where I'm getting the data from. The TSX, TMX group has been lending me slides for years. This is their most recent one. And it shows that 36% of the mining equity capital raised globally was on their exchanges, and that 48% of the mine financings. This just goes and, and reinstills the fact that Canada is the center of the mining finance universe uh, with the number of companies and the amount of financings that are done. So my data set. I'm only going to talk about public Canadian mineral companies. And despite being an American, the U.S. mineral companies are not relevant from a body count perspective. Market cap, they're important. But in terms of the number of true American companies, there's very few. In fact, most of the companies listed on U.S. stock exchanges are Canadians that are cross-listed. I've got over 15,000 companies in the database, and I've studied them since 1970 to 2024. And I'm this is for all types of mineral companies. As long as you're mineral... That counts. I don't care what your commodity is, although I do track all that. And then basically, I've been measuring things like the birth rate, the death rate, immigration, emigration rate, plus some other statistics. This is the data set that I'm drawing from for this talk. So let's first start by talking about how companies are born. And we only have a couple of paths. They're either born into the mineral industry, such as with an IPO or an RTO. And in the case of a reverse takeover, Somebody has a shell company that's that's in compliance. Somebody else buys it. They load in some new ideas, some new assets, raise some new money, and it's basically like Phoenix rising from the ashes. Uh, they come back out. There's very few companies that are created by spinoffs. 
Uh, we typically see this in a situation where a company has a large primary asset and a bunch of expiration projects. Somebody takes over their company, but they don't want the expiration project. So they spin them out into their own public company. And the shareholders of, of the targeted company get shares in both. And then the last one is called name changes. And name changes are very, very prominent as the way that most mineral companies are born and die. And the simplest way to look at this is why do companies change their names? In the vast majority of cases, it's because they've run out of money, they can't do anything else, so they need to reinvent themselves. They basically get recapitalized. And if you think about every company as being like an organism within a herd, the food of our industry is money. So when you run out of money, you die. And how do you get reinvented or, or recreated? You do it by changing your name, rolling back the shares, recapitalizing, all that good stuff. Um, and be aware, and I'll be coming back to this name change issue a couple of times. If I have a company named X and then I rename it Y, company X dies and company Y is born. That's how I count them. So they have a bit of a neutralizing impact as well. The other way that companies are born is that they're immigrate. They immigrate into the business. Most of the new companies that are formed these days are done through capital pool companies, CPCs. Well, technically, CPCs are, are a legal entity. They're not a mining entity. So when they finally find their asset and do a qualifying transaction, roll the asset in it, then they become a mineral company. So that's immigration. Um, we see a lot of this with industry changes and, again, We'll also see this with name changes. And, and during Terry's lengthy career, of which I've been around for most of as well, you remember the dot-coms? Everybody went into dot-coms. We had the cannabis craze. Uh, we have different crazes and fads that come in where companies change. So this is how, you, here's an example of immigration for you. Uh, people are in the, in the minerals, or people are in the cannabis business, they decide to come back to the mineral business after that fad ran its course. And same thing, emigration would be when a mineral company leaves. You often see mineral companies, for some reason, a lot of times when they leave the industry, they go into pharmaceuticals. And some of that's cannabis related, but some of it's drug related. Uh, you'll see them go into a wide variety of industries that are totally separate and unrelated to mining. So when you see that, you kind of know it was a shell company and, and it's being reinvented. So if we start plotting this stuff up, this is a graph that shows you the birth of companies versus how many were immigration. And as you can rapidly tell, very few companies enter the business by immigration. Uh, it's kind of interesting if you think about it, because if you have a public Canadian shell company and lithium prices take off or some other commodity price takes off, good time to get into that business. You're in full compliance. All you got to do is change the name and off to the races. Um, but in fact, we don't see that much immigration. Most of the companies are born by IPO or by name change, and the vast majority are name change. Also notice that you'll see a lot of these arrows that are pointing down. It seems to be the way of our lives these days. But I'm particularly interested in what the pandemic did to the mining industry. And so you'll notice the arrow here since 2020. Uh, we've seen a decline in the birth of companies, and we've also seen a decline in the immigration of companies into our space. So then I took these companies and I said, well, let's take a look at them by their primary commodity. Uh, as you know, many companies are chasing multiple metals, but almost everybody has a primary commodity and, and it appears whenever they can, they want to call it gold. So they'll, they'll get a better coverage by the analyst and hopefully get a better market multiple. So what I did is I took the five largest commodities, companies buy primary commodity, and then I lumped all the rest of them, 25 other commodities into the other category. And you can see the predominance of gold companies. The precious metal public companies on the Canadian markets are just about 50% of the total number of public companies. After that, you've got lithium there in blue, and you can see the run in lithium, the number of lithium companies from 2020 up to 23, and then they've dropped off in 24. Well, why is that? Well, part of it was the whole EV fad. And then sometime last year, and, and definitely this year, everybody realizes that it's not going as fast as everybody planned. Um, 
lithium prices have collapsed so people aren't jumping onto the lithium bandwagon as quickly uh, if you look at copper copper was doing great up until about 23 and then the number of new copper companies has dropped off dramatically i find that very interesting given copper prices and the fact that this whole electric revolution requires copper or requires far more copper than it does lithium or nickel so i find that an interesting uh, aspect and i haven't had a chance to dig deeper um silver is in fourth place and as you know a lot of silver deposits have gold a lot of gold deposits have silver but i actually separate them out by how the company portrays its primary commodity and then finally nickel which is another ev metal <clears throat> Okay, let's look by project status. And this is kind of what you'd expect. Most of the companies are exploration companies. Uh, very few of them are in development and producers. And, uh, and again, look at the trend. Since 2020, the trend has been going down. And in the next slide, I wanna show you this. I'll give you the table for this one because it's really telling. And here's what I want you to look at. Uh, let's just take uh, the exploration table. You can see how in 2020, there was 200 exploration companies. And, and by 2023, we're roughly half of that. And through August of this year, we have 60 new exploration companies. So if you just annualize it, it's about 90. It still shows a growing decline. Next, look at the developers. You know, in 2020, we had 12 and then 18, and then boom, uh, money got tight, people couldn't work at the mines because of COVID, what have you. It dropped way off. And now it's been fluctuating around five or six new companies every year. And then finally, producers. <clears throat> producers, the smallest group that get born. And again, notice that we went from a large number, relatively large number in 2020. And now we're, we're just a little bit over half of that, that numbers. So when you look all the way to the far right at it, you can see that the number of companies being born has been declining at a pretty precipitous rate. And uh, this is based on 700 companies um, between 2020 and, and August of this year. And at the bottom there, I have a definition. So how I break them out, I actually go through every company. I have a classification system that will categorize companies by 11 different uh, ways, 11 different ranks. And then I roll them together for these types of study. So we've covered how they, they're they born. Now let's talk about how companies die. And we're very good at dying. There's all sorts of different ways you can die in the mining business. Um, the easiest one is just, uh, I can't come up with a better title than death. You go bankrupt, your CCA protection, your charter is canceled or dissolved. We don't see that as much as we used to. Back in the 70s and 90s, we saw a lot of charters getting canceled. Um, delisting, companies get delisted for a lot of different reasons and they can relist, but normally once a company is delisted, it doesn't come back. Uh, there is the odd exception, uh, but not very often. And then finally, liquidation, and I would throw in privatization. Every year we see one or two companies that just decides it's had it being public and they go private. Uh, it seems to be a bit of an increasing number too, which comes to a much bigger issue about the lack of money coming in and whether the Canadian financial markets are strong enough to support all these companies. Under takeovers, I threw in the, the, the three obvious ones, amalgamation, direct purchases, and mergers. Um, uh, this, is, this is how most producers get taken over. And then again, we have name changes, which I talked about. And then finally, uh, companies leave the business. They just, they've had enough. Or we saw a big surge going out into cannabis a couple of years ago. And, now those companies are working their way back in the minerals because cannabis has kind of peaked. <clears throat> so when we plot these up, um, you can see the various components, how they're dying. But curiously enough, we're also seeing a decline in the death rate. So if you have a decline in the birth rate and a decline in the death rate, you'd think that would be a good thing. Um, most of these changes, again, are in blue for name changes, although takeovers, which include those three categories, uh, are pretty consistent year to year. We get a handful every year. And then uh, companies don't notice the gray bar, which is companies dying by, you know, bankruptcy and other things. We don't see that that often. And the reason is usually nowadays, because of the cost to go public with an IPO, 
If a company's in severe financial shape, it'll turn into a shell company. They'll try to clean it up. They'll try to find a new avenue for it rather than losing the legal entity. And that's why you're seeing fewer and fewer uh, that just die. And then immigration, which is people just changing their, their business completely. Um, as you know, there's some accounting consequences if you change your business, uh, but that's also dropped way off. So what it's telling you is that immigration is a very small piece of it. Most companies stay in the mining business once they're in the mining business, and then they get recycled through uh, shell company behavior. So let's tie these two things together. Uh, first is, how does the population size change? Well, you've got new companies coming into the industry through birth and immigration, and you have companies leaving through death and emigration. This, by the way, is fundamental to any population size. And for those of you who haven't met me, my, my first major was in zoology, where I fell in love with the mathematical modeling of herd populations, which is exactly what I'm doing with these studies, only applying it to public companies. And as you'll see next year, the math holds up. So each one of you are a deer or your company is a deer. That's how to look at your life, you know? So the next thing we have is the mortality rate. Well, the mortality rate is simply birth plus immigration, less death plus immigration. That's, that's, it's that simple. And, and by doing these calculations, you can say, is the herd thinning or growing? And again, let's just use a deer metaphor. You know, if the population of deer is too large for a given area, the wildlife managers will give out more hunting tags to thin out the herd. Similarly, if the, if the population is really small, then they'll cut the hunting tags back and let the population re-go. So understanding the mortality rate is a very important way of studying the health of our herd. And that's, that's really the science that I work on behind the scenes. So let's just take the last four years. If we plot these up, you can see that 20 and 21 were good years, followed by three negative years. And this year is negative, but less negative than last year. I'm not going to advocate that two points make a trend, but I hope I'm right, and it is, and things are getting better. Um, so why, why two years? Well, when COVID hit, a lot of companies were cashed up. The minute we shut down the airports and the ports and travel and work and everything, um, people were able to save money. They weren't spending money on drilling. So what that did is it extended their working capital and it took them well into 2021. And then everybody got back with the program and got back working and started burning through their working capital. And then some companies got in trouble because everybody was expecting metal prices to go up and they didn't. And so then we started to see a net death rate uh, for these companies. So this is a very good way of looking at uh, the mortality rate. And I wanna take this to, to an even larger level because this is where I find it really exciting. Here's, here's the mortality rate since 1970. And uh, as you see at the bottom there, I have almost 10,000 companies that were born and 11,000 that died. So I'm in excess of the 30 minimum you need for statistical purposes. I actually update this every month, and I find it fascinating because I get to preview where our industry is going along before the rest of you. But if you go back and, and just look at it in general, um, the thing that pops out to you right away is Black Monday in 1987. And even though everybody was complaining about the Great Recession, how bad it is, it was nowhere near as bad as Black Monday. And in the last 50-odd years, that that market correction devastated our industry. And curiously, because we always wonder whether coincidences are, in fact, coincidence or plan, 1987 was about when I got into the mining business. I had nothing to do with the downfall, but uh, I spent the first 15 years of my career suffering from the high mortality rate in the business. We then got into the time period of 2002 to 2000, roughly 11, which was the famous Chinese super cycle when uh, we all got fat and happy and thought it would go on forever, which unfortunately it didn't. And in 2009, uh, we had the Great Recession kick in. But notice not as many companies, net companies died as they did in, in Black Monday. Um, we then popped out of it just as COVID hit. And it would be interesting if we didn't have COVID, whether those would all be green bars uh, on the right-hand side there. 
but but think about your career and think about whether it's metal price cycles or just your gut feeling about the business. These are the cycles you've all seen, particularly those of us that have been around too long. Um, we've had these boom and bust cycles. So just starting with 1970, and I started with 1970 because it's a round number, not because it was an important historical foot point. That green positive cycle was 17 years long. Black Monday was roughly a 14 year cycle. So three years less than the prior bull. The next bull cycle lasted roughly nine years or five years less than the negative. And uh, the cycle for the Great Recession lasted roughly seven. So these cycles are getting compressed over time. And, and unfortunately, I can't make a prediction on where we are right now because uh, we haven't really established a new pattern yet. Um, but if you're looking at things like financing, or you're looking at long-term strategic planning, knowing where we are in the mortality rate curve is really critical because it tells you whether you need to be saving money or spending money. And uh, that's where I find these particularly uh, useful. So I've got a couple more slides. Um, there's some really interesting stuff that pops out of research like this because my job is to do a proper job in collecting numbers. But when you start doing the analysis, which is kind of like the gravy for me, you find some really interesting factoids, as I call them. So using just the last couple of years since, since the pandemic, the average lifespan for an expiration stage company was eight years. And uh, that's almost 600 examples. There weren't, you know, there was a tenth of that in terms of developers, and they typically last about seven years. Um, but look at the producers. We've got almost 50 producers in the last five years. They typically last three years. And this is because once you're up and running and you've de-risked your mine or you've de-risked your company, you're a prime takeover candidate and you die very quickly. So a lot of times when you see these new companies being formed that are coming out of the chutes as producers, a uh, good chance they're not going to be around very long, um, which is good if you're an investor and bad if you're an employee. <laughs> so you got to think about these things. Now, another factoid is, and I started doing this this year, and don't ask me why, I don't have a life or some good reason like that. But I, I was wondering about how long it typically took from when you were born to when your share price hit peak value. And you know, I showed you here that the, these most of these companies are around for seven or eight years. And in fact, look at the frequency of how many of them hit their peak price within the first year. And if you go into that in even more detail, there's an alarming number of companies who hit their peak share price the day they were born. And then for the rest of their life, they go downhill. And then as you go out, um, you can see the numbers drop off very quickly. So if you have a company you've invested in for seven or eight years, odds are it's already hit its peak price. <laughs> Sorry about that. Now, I know what Terry's going to say is, Doug, you know, you need to plot this up against discovery rates and all that. Yeah, sure. In my spare time, Terry, I'll jump right on it. So a couple other factoids, which I don't have graphs for, but it's very interesting. You think about, think about your average year. You know, you, you start out the first of the year, and I think hypothetically, and, and maybe I'll, I'll be able to tell you this more next year, the best time to raise money is usually in the first quarter of the year. Well, why is that? That's because the institutional managers and the fund managers uh, don't like buying stock in, in the fourth quarter because they're worried about their performance, their bonus, how their firm does. Uh, but come January, they got 365 days to make money and do great things. And so the first quarter of the year tends to be a pretty interesting fundraising quarter. And I will prove this in, in the continued research, but my gut tells me you want to raise money in the first quarter um, and not in the last. So what I did was I thought, well, let's let's apply that to birth and death rates. So if we look at all those companies when they were born, the month they were born or the month they died, is there a month which is preferential for being born or dying? You know, you'd think everybody'd be dying at the end of the year, right? They've run out of money, they can't raise money. And in fact, in both cases, it's fairly level. There's no bias for being born or died relative to what month of the year you're in. These are the interesting factoids that only Doug collects. Okay, so I want to go back to something else here. 
uh, TMX group generously gave me this information, and it does not include CSE or NEX financings. Um, but for this year, the first half of the year, they said they raised $6.8 billion, when last year the total was $7.7 .7. Now, uh, I don't I, I don't think we can just say, well, if in six months you raise 6.8, then in 12 months you're going to raise 13.6. That would make it higher than 2019, which was a banner year. But the point is, I showed you before that the mortality rate is reducing, which means we have less companies dying, more companies being born. And if you look at these financing numbers for the year, annualize these, this could be 2024 could be a very good year for financing. Well, that tells me if it's a good year for financing, then there's going to be fewer companies dying and uh, more companies growing, whether they're they're born or whether they're name changing or what have you. So I found this, they, they just gave this as data as of July. I found this fascinating because I work in the world and I'm chairman of a small public company where we spend all of our money, all of our time dialing for dollars. And yet this graph is telling me that a lot of money is being raised and, and on an annualized basis, this may be a banner year. So for those of you who are depressed about how hard it is to raise money, things may be getting better than you actually think. And one of my next steps is to take all this type of data that, and the TMX groups are very generous in sharing their data with me and doing it for the whole industry going back 10 years so we can actually see the trends. So in summary, this is part of a much larger investigation where I'm trying to quantify whether there's too many mineral companies. What I've given you today is the primer on how I do this. And the next step is to look at how market capitalizations and financings have changed over time, especially with respect to commodities and project stage. I have a funny feeling that a disproportionate amount of the financing is going into the largest companies at the expense of the expiration, the early stage companies. And if that is, that's very dangerous because as I showed you in a prior graph, the majority of companies are at the expiration stage. There's very few at the producing stage. And, and, and part of that is because expiration is a high risk business. We need a lot of companies out there exploring um, in order to be the feedstock for the major uh, producers who as I showed you in one of those graphs, they seem to preferentially like to buy smaller producers. So there's a lot of interesting facts that I, I haven't been able to establish yet, but I'm working on it. And with respect to that, since you've suffered through my presentation, if you have opinions, data, bias, even conspiracy theories on what I'm talking about and where you think it's all going, I would love to hear from you because my job is to quantify the truth when, once I know what the issues are that people want to address. So with that, um, stay tuned. I'll, I'll be back next year somewhere and hopefully give you the rest of the story. And special thanks to uh, CIM, TMX Group, Stockwatch, and the Northern Miner. The, the Northern Miner uh, is where I get a lot of my data. I've gone through every Canadian mine handbook since 1965, company by company. And uh, the Northern Mine have been great in helping me out. So, Terry, with that, back to you. Thank you, Doug. This is, this is actually very detailed and very focused research. I guess uh, at the end of the research process, sometime we will have some models whereby you may say that diversified company, focused company, but obviously gold always shows up in these in these equations, right? And uh, and what about the management? Like the management also, maybe you haven't tracked them, but do they move from gold to lithium, from there to copper? I mean, there's this migration as well within the companies in terms of from commodity to commodity and management to management. We find that a lot. Like you probably see about between three to five companies a week. And I just met them yesterday. They were in the copper business, they're back in the gold business. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, lithium, I mean, when I was at school, we studied lithium 30, 40 years ago, maybe more than that. But now it, it came back. Obviously, it's, good. it's having its own cycle. And uh, yeah, there, there, is, there are other variables here, but we shouldn't be losing our management, our skill set. And how do you protect it? You know, yeah, on, on the management issue, 
um, you will see managements change commodities more quickly in the expiration stage companies. You know, they kind of follow the fad uh, to raise money and keep going. Once you get into producers and stuff, the number of qualified managers, for instance, who can run a mining company as opposed to a mineral company, it becomes a very small population and they, uh, they all know each other and they tend to move around among among their companies. You only lose them by old age and, and, uh, and you know, unfortunately by death. But um, it's the younger managers and the younger companies that you'll see them jumping around on commodities uh, a lot quicker. You know, one of the things that we used to do, and I, th I think a lot of people actually may be following the same pattern, going around the PDAC floors or the CIM floors, see which, which companies are doing which commodities. Like there were years where iron ore was, you know, not much of a focus. Now you don't see too much about iron ore. But yet we've seen fertilizer companies come and go. Uranium companies were not existent about 10, 12 years ago. Now they, they're like everywhere. Maybe there's no, an actually... in, inverse correlation. Actually, uranium is there, there. There's never been a lot of uranium companies, but there's been a consistent number over time. And and in the larger the 60 year database I'm working on, I was surprised because I thought with uranium, since we go through boom and bust cycles so quickly with them, that we would see that pattern in their mortality. And and you don't really. It's um, but I agree with you. There are a lot of uranium companies. The one that amazed me was lithium. I mean, 10 years ago, I doubt there were 10. Canadian lithium companies, and right now there's 185. So uh, that's been the latest. You know, I don't want to call it a fad because sometimes these things actually last. But when you have cycles where something becomes popular and all of a sudden everybody's switching to it, has fad-like characteristics. Lithium is definitely one of them. And with lithium prices collapsing, it's going to be interesting watching whether they stay in lithium or whether they switch to other commodities. Um, time will tell. And and there's also some migration or immigration issues as well, as we've seen recently, that, for instance, Canadian government exercising their extraterritorial uh, capability of telling uh, companies for their partnerships or the takeovers certain jurisdictions. And we've seen some of them recently saying that we will move our head office from here to another country. Okay. Yeah, that, like from Canada to Dubai, something like that. Dubai and plus uh, one actually yeah. went, they went is going back to Ecuador, for instance. So they're not from yeah. Ecuador, but the problem. Well, that's the that's to get around the Chinese issue. Yeah. <clears throat> so I mean, there are a lot of data here that uh, to to actually got will 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 change the the picture. But nevertheless, nevertheless, the the, the pattern, the trend line is quite evident. Now, can can we say? Doug, to the audience that if they have any ideas or questions, they can send it to you. Do yeah, you sure, by all means. And are there any questions? You have people in the chat room. Are there any questions? I don't see any questions here. Yep, actually, there are a couple of questions that came in early. Uh, Rob Cohen was asking, oh, um, sorry, a couple of direct messages. Um, the questions are whether what's happening with the Australian listed companies and what about London and so on? Any thoughts? Yes. On what? Um, I gave, uh, I've given pay. I gave papers on that last year and the year before um, the Australian stock exchange is the second largest holder of companies after the TSXV. Um, they, they are easily in second place and everybody else. It just, it drops way off. Uh, London has been coming on stronger, but um, a lot of people I know that have listed in London or thought about it have commented on how expensive and how overregulated it is. And so it's a bit of a deterrent to be listed there. I think also with the Ukraine war, uh, you know, the one thing about London is if you want to invest in any country in the world, regardless of its political stability, it used to be listed on London. But, you know, like a lot of the Russian companies and stuff, I think because of Ukraine war and a few other things, um, there's not a need to be on AIM or, or London like there used to be. That's my personal opinion, without fact. So what about migration, immigration between the countries? Like Australians are coming to Canada because they cannot believe how cheap our stocks are versus the valuation in certain sectors in Australia. Yeah, and if and if you look at the hard numbers, and I I actually have them, but not for this presentation, 
Australian companies will typically survive on the Canadian stock exchanges for three to five years. And they, for some reason, they don't get the following they were expecting, so they give it up. And I've yeah. seen that, Terry, I've seen that over 30 years. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they kind of yes. come and go. Yes. Um, other other ones, I mean, there are, there are some Chinese-focused companies that are listed in Canada. Um, you don't see... You, you know, you're more likely to see those foreign mining companies listed on the OTC or ADRs in the U.S. than you are to see proper listing in Canada. So the other thing that really got my attention here, I'm sure the audience as well, is that how early the stock prices or the value of the company peaks and then kind of drifts away. Yeah. I mean, I, I've got the graphs both done yearly and done monthly. And and uh, the reason I didn't show the monthly one or, you know, the number of days is because there it's bimodal. And I've got to figure out what the longer duration mode is caused by. My bet is it's probably due to a discovery or an acquisition that basically resets the company and lets it run again. Um, but what you see, and, and it's a number I track, is when people change their names, they often do rollbacks. And you know, yeah. if your stock's trading at 20 cents and you do 10 to one rollback, you're never gonna be at $2. So for me, it's pretty easy to figure out where the peak is. Uh, but uh, a lot of them are, are well less than a year. Um, I was just trying to figure out a way to group them in general. And a uh, surprising number of them are like within 60 or 90 days of when they are born. Um, can I jump in here? Um, sure. It seems that the the chat group is 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 sending messages to the host. So go ahead and send your messages to us. We will let you know what they say. So there is one question here from Anne. Uh, how, if it can be quantified, does China's dominance in metals processing manufacturing play into influence your data and results? Well, it, it it only influences my data if they're listed on the Canadian Stock Exchange. I'm not making a case that the Canadian companies dominate the world of supply and demand. If you take gold alone, most of the world's largest gold companies are not North American. Uh, that's a transition that's occurred over the last 10, 15 years. Um, China's dominance in copper is well known, uh, not only in the number of deposits they have, but also their smelting and refining capacity. Um, but this study is really looking at the demographic of Canadian companies. So maybe the answer to your question, and I've, I've done this before, is to put the headquarters in for each of the companies. And I did this in 2019. Um, and, and it's kind of what you'd expect. You know, Canadian companies tend to be domiciled in Canada. Uh, Australians tend to be domiciled in Australia. And, and the Chinese will go through Hong Kong um, or they'll ADR or list on one of the, the US exchanges rather than the Canadian. Okay, thank you. Can one infer, this is from Curtis, can one infer that underwriters are the real winners for peak valuations and other investors lose out? Uh, you know, one thing humans are not very good at is predicting the future. And I don't think for a minute underwriters are any better than the rest of us. Uh, it's really, uh, it, it's a whole, there's a whole area of science that I haven't had a chance to jump into yet, which is called momentum investing, where you don't use the analyst reports, you look at trading volumes and, 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 and trade based on volume behavior, almost like what chartists do, rather than on, on economics. And you got to realize if most of the companies are expiration companies, they have no revenues. So their earnings are irrelevant, their balance sheets are irrelevant. Um, you know, so how do you how do you measure them? You have to measure them by what they're doing and and whether they're in fact creating value. And as Terry's well aware, and all of us who do valuations, that is one complicated task to sort through. Okay, thanks. Uh, from Sally, are you looking at privatization? It was quite noticeable. China came in and took a bunch of lithium and other battery metals in the middle twenty teens. Once private, they went dark. It's worrying that it shows a tendency from those type of governments to have a more long-term vision than investors. Yeah, I would agree with markets. your. I would agree with your general comment, but in terms of Canadian companies going private, 
it's a handful every year. I doubt there's 10 a year. Um, it's it's not occurring very often. You're you're really talking about taking assets out of public companies and taking them private. And that goes to the whole issue of transparency and and you know, um, there's many governments that are not very transparent. And that's their preference, and they see a strategic advantage. As somebody who's both run public companies and worked in private equity, if I had my druthers, I would always be private. <laughs> it's, it's, and it's not to hide information. It's that you can get more done and, and without having to report it. You, you can get your business agenda done without all the regulation and reporting and all the other stuff. Um, so it depends on your investor group who benefits from being public or being private. Thank you. Any other questions? Please free to pop them into the chat. Um, nothing else here at the moment. Maybe we could just give people one more minute to uh, see if we have any last questions. Uh, in the meantime, just to let everyone know that this vid the video of this presentation and Q and A will be available on the MES website. That's cimmes.org, and you just look under past events. There, let's see if there's anything else that's come in. Uh, nothing else? No other questions at yeah. the moment? No, I see right. one here. Came through my okay. WhatsApp, actually. I don't know why. Um, it says, what does it say? Um, quality of management and reputation are driving the financings more than the property when they go public. Um let me answer that a different way. I know what they're asking or what they're saying. Um, there are people that have proven themselves in the Canadian markets. Uh, we affectionately know them as Bay Street Country Club. And if you're a member of the country club, yes, it's easier for you to raise financing than a stranger to the markets or people that haven't proven themselves. Uh, we've seen this countless times uh, with certain individuals who seem to be able to raise money when nobody around them can. It has to do with your network, your personal relation, then your reputation. Um, with respect to companies, you know, we're back to the peak share price. You know, there's the three P's of investing. There's the people, there's the project, and there's the plan. And one of the things I find fascinating when I was in private equity was some field geologist that wanted to build a mine. And they had no experience running or building mines, and somehow they felt they could do it. And the odds are about 99.97% eh, of the time they would fail. So this issue of management goes to beyond this. If you're a successful explorer and you discover a major deposit and you drill it out and you have a gigantic resource, then that's time for you to turn the reins over to a CEO who's qualified to take it to the next level. But because most people's sense of personal net worth is tied up in the discovery and developing it, they tend not to do that. And that that is a problem with um, developing minds. You know, this week, I just want to make a closing comment. This week, uh, the hot paper of the week, and companies came to see me. They all started saying that, oh, by the way, in the past 20 years or 30 years or 15 years, whatever, we discovered this and we sold it for hundreds of millions of dollars. I mean, that's another credibility. They're not developing it. Something actually did develop sometimes, some somewhat, but I think that reputation of adding value of the past. Are we going to see it again? Because the charts, like from SMP, you see it with discovering less and less big deposits. Our grades are coming down, right? Yes. So, so there's there's a uh, underlying concern and worry that well, <laughs> the sooner the sooner the better you make the money. That's fine. This may be people are rushing boosting the price up and they're disappearing. How's that? Yeah. So so uh, a couple, there's, you asked a couple of questions there. One of them is, is the grade, uh, have all the easy ones been found, all the big discoveries been made? Absolutely not. I talked about this in my, my PDAC keynote a couple of years ago, where I took a discovery chart from the 1960s, 1980, and currently, and they always show a shortage of recent discoveries. So I don't, I don't buy that argument at all. But in terms of grade, yes, grade is dropping, but take gold. I mean, gold's gone from $35 an ounce to $2,600 an ounce. You can drop the cutoff grade and still have valuable ore. So when people give that argument that the grade's getting lower and lower, the reason the grades are getting lower and lower is because the metal price allows you to lower the grade. 
if we went back to an eight hundred dollar an ounce gold price, uh, a lot of these million ounce deposits would disappear in a heartbeat. So you got to make sure you understand the metal price role in the resource. And this is a very complicated subject because there's so many variables that go into a you know a PEA or a feasibility study, and cutoff grade is one of the big ones. So when I see a company come out with a press release saying, "Oh, we doubled our resources," and then the only thing they did was change the metal price, it's like, "All right, yeah. good job, guys." You know, took a lot of extra drill holes to get that extra ounce, didn't it? You know, you have to be very careful about when people put out press releases saying that. You need to know why they have more ore. And usually it's because they have more drill holes, they have better drilling, infill drilling, stuff like that. But occasionally somebody will be clever and a half and just you know just use the metal price as their great success story. Uh, we have a couple more comments and questions. Uh, Terry, uh, if you don't mind, I'll just read these off. Yeah, go here. ahead because I'm not seeing them here. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll try and fix this. I'm not sure why they're coming to the host, but it's not a problem. Um, we have a comment from Anne Carpenter. Excellent discussions. Thanks for having Doug on. Jane, thank you, Doug, for your interesting research and analysis. Uh, a Forsyth, do you think there's a relationship between the company life death with generational differences, e.g. lifelong careers, etc.? No. No, come... No, I, I don't think so. I, 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 I'm I not sure how you would quantify an answer to that. But in general, no. I mean, going back to a comment Terry made before, you know, when when Terry and I were were growing up during the late Cretaceous, um, <laughs> you would work for a major mining company for your whole life or you'd work for a junior company your whole life. And then in the 1980s, when the big mining companies started you know, the oil companies took them over and they started laying everybody off. We saw people with training in major companies going to smaller companies. Today, it's kind of like that Dr. Zeus book, you know, the guys with the stars on their chest and the ones without the stars. Uh, management teams come from both big companies and small companies. And as far as I'm concerned, nobody has a monopoly on expertise anymore. Uh, big companies don't put as much in the research as they used to. They don't seem to have the same training programs they used to. They're they're quick to lay off employees if you know if metal prices burp. Um, so nowadays, management teams are this collective big company, small company experience. I think the number of years you've been in the business is probably the greatest key to whether you're any good. Because if you've been in the business like Terry has for what 120 years, Terry, um, you had to have done something right to last that long. So. You know, the guys that are in, I, I had a company brought to me recently where the chief geologist had been in the mining business for five years. And, you know, I'm not quite sure I'd want to back that horse. He's a bit green, you know, but there's a lot of guys with 20, 30 years experience. And a lot of them are now finding their successors They're They actually have protégés that they're bringing up and sharing their knowledge, sharing their experience and trying to make them better than they were. And I think that's that's the wonderful part, the mentoring part of the business right now with so many of us being so old is, is really an exciting part of the business. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Keith Spence is asking, has your research shown which type of company model has a higher survival or success rate? Is it single metal company or multi-metal company? No, uh, no, I haven't done that yet. And, uh, and, uh, you know, Keith, we should, we should talk about these results privately. No, I haven't, I haven't, uh, I haven't been able to go that far yet. I, I'm, I'm still working at 50,000 foot level. Okay, thank you. And that's uh, all the questions that have come in. Great. Wonderful. Jackie, well, thank you for the great questions. Doug, I mean, you, you initiate people's queries, I mean, the curiosity. And obviously, we're all curious, uh, this thing, but you put a lot of the connected dots and more dots to be connected. And uh, we wish you well. Looking forward for next year, 2025, more data and more but maybe about Keith asking the right question, I guess, looking for a shortcut solution to, to all those analyses. <laughs> um, Jackie, is there anything else to say? Um, no, just, to, just thank you. And to remind everyone uh, who might have missed the beginning, you can always find the video uh, at, C at cimmes.org. Uh, look for uh, uh, just past events and you'll see a list of all the discussion group uh, meetings there, those that we could post, and this video will be there as well. Fantastic. Doug, we thank you. It's great. Really is my pleasure. Great, great Everybody, to see take you. care. Your brain, your, your your curiosity is our curiosity. Be shared. Good. Well, thank Good. You. Send me send me ideas. I love studying them. <laughs> see you.
Thank you, Bye -bye. everybody, for joining us. And our next one going to be, I believe, in at the end of next month, October, right? Yes. Jackie? Yes. yes, that's right. October 31st is a Thursday, so not our usual Wednesday, but we look forward to everyone being there. Come and hear what we have to say before you head off to trick-or-treat with kids. Bye-bye, right. everybody. Bye-bye.